Well, good afternoon, um, and welcome to our seventh and final installment of the uh, 2011 Concert Lectures in Revealed Theology. Um, we've been treated to um, a lot of insights, a lot of interesting and provocative um, theological discussions, and um, we look forward to this one on necessity and, and passability and aseity, right? Close. Yeah. Close. Yeah. Close enough. Thanks. All right, thanks, Bruce. Thank you, Tom. The title of this lecture is The Being of God as Gift and Grace, subtitle on Freedom and Necessity, Aseity, and the Divine Attributes. I want to begin with a passage that I've lifted from Karl Barth's Church Dogmatics, Volume 2, Part 2. It's the uh, volume devoted to the doctrine of election. And this passage will kind of be basic to this lecture in, in the sense that much of what I say will be a, an explication of what I think its meaning ought to be. <laughs> Whether it is or not exactly as Bart intended is open for debate, but at any rate. This is what Bart writes. There can be no tenet of Christian truth which does not from the very first contain within itself as its basis the fact that from and to all eternity God is the electing God. There can be no tenet of Christian doctrine which, if it is to be a Christian tenet, does not necessarily reflect both in form and content this divine electing. The eternal electing in which and in virtue of which God does not will to be God and is not God apart from those who are his, apart from his people. Because this is the case, the doctrine of election occupies a place at the head of all other Christian dogmas. And it belongs to the doctrine of God himself because God himself does not will to be God and is not God except as the one who elects. There is no height or depth in which God can be God in any other way." Unquote. Back in the mid-1980s, Robin Williams starred in a film called Moscow on the Hudson. It was a bit of a departure for him as a comedic actor. The film certainly had its comedic moments, but it was a serious film and quite poignant. Williams played a Russian a musician who played for the Russian National Circus, which, was scheduled, which is scheduled to tour America. We first meet William's character, Vladimir, in Moscow. This is the Soviet Union in its death throes. Virtually all of the staples of life are in short supply, so much so that whenever Vladimir sees a line of people outside of a store, he joins it, knowing that whatever is being sold, and it might only be one item that has turned up, will be needed by his family and other people in his building. And so he joins a line, for example, in order to buy toilet paper for all. Fast forward, and he is in New York City. Everything is new and wonderful. While on a shopping expedition to Bloomingdale's, he makes the sudden decision unexpected even to himself, to defect. He is whisked away by police. Weeks pass. He is now living in New York, cut off from the wife he loves, trying to figure out how things work. He goes into a supermarket to buy coffee. Confronted by a dizzying array of differing brands of coffee, which seem to cover half of an aisle on one side, he begins to hyperventilate, falls to the floor, and has to be taken to an emergency room. So what is Director Paul Mazursky's point in all of this? That what we think of as freedom in the West isn't always what it's cracked up to be? That living a life of dignity and worth happens in other places and under completely different conditions of life? Probably. What is clear is that freedom as a choice amongst options is not what the New Testament thinks of as freedom, in the first instance at least. Neither in the realm of anthropology, nor in Christology, nor ultimately in relation to God. The freedom of the Christian, freedom in a genuinely theological sense, is a freedom for which human beings must be set free by Christ, 
through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, for example, John 8, 32 and 36, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 13, 1 Peter 2, 16. The freedom spoken of in, the, in these passages is a freedom not to do this or that in accordance with personal taste or desire, but rather a freedom which is only experienced in the doing of God's will. That which is good and right and that only. And so Peter says, quote, as servants of God, live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. That a human being is self-activating self on the basis of rational and moral considerations in doing the good is quite true. But freedom is not a word used to describe this precondition in the doer of the good, but rather that which is experienced in the doing itself. The model of free living is Christ himself, who subjected his will in a continuous and unbroken fashion to the will of his Father. Doing the will of his Father, accomplishing the work the Father has given him to do, is for Jesus food, the stuff which gives life, according to John 4.34. In fact, Jesus does not do anything on his own initiative. He seeks in all things to do his Father's will, John 5.30. For he knows that he was sent into this world precisely for this, John 6, 38. Doing the Father's will can come at great personal cost and only through intense struggle, as in the dramatic scene in the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew 26, 42, Mark 14, 36, and Luke 22, 42. And so it comes as no surprise that Jesus should admonish us to do likewise in teaching us to pray, thy will be done. Nowhere is there is the evidence of a concern, is there evidence of a concern for having options. In fact, in the one place where options are discussed, in Gethsemane, when Jesus pleadingly asks his father whether the world might not be redeemed through another way than the way of the cross, his prayer is met with silence. He already knows this is the only option, even though accepting what he knows to be good is quite literally excruciating. And as for God, nowhere are we told that God deliberated amongst options before deciding to create or redeem. In Genesis 1.1, the phrase, in the beginning, finds God already in the process of creating. It does not so much as gesture towards a precondition of creative activity in God himself. It simply narrates creation. In a clear riff on, John, on Genesis 1.11, John opens his gospel with the very same phrase, in the beginning. Given the clear reference to Genesis, it would seem to me that the beginning spoken of here in John is the act of turning towards the world in creation, a point confirmed in verse 3. And the word which was with God in the beginning is the word through which God turns to the world, the word of his power, who can be with God only because his identity already includes, by way of anticipation, a human face, as verses 3 through 14 tell us. Where then do we get the idea that God must freely choose amongst options in order to be free? From the word grace? No, not from there either. Grace means most fundamentally unmerited, undeserved, without any claim on God. That is who we are and what we are, not only as sinners but even already as created. Nothing we are or do conditions God in any way. God does what he does because that is the kind of God he is. So where do we get the idea? The answer, I think, is from reflection on the philosophical problem of so-called free will as a sort of precondition 
or requisite capacity in all who would engage in moral behavior. The scheme of rewards and punishments, it is often said, presupposes the existence in the one who would do the good of such a capacity. Were it lacking, God would be unfair to judge those who do wrong. Origen of Alexandria made quite a point of this in his great work on first principles in arguing against determinism. And there is a fair bit of biblical evidence to suggest that he's right, although before deciding the question, we would need to ask ourselves whether God's way of judging sin in the event of the cross and setting things right in justification might not qualify all of the passages which point in this direction, making them all to be at least somewhat hypothetical. But that's a subject for another day. My point here is that the concept of freedom we might elicit from the choose you this day whom you will serve kind of passages, Joshua 25:15, function around the edges of New Testament reflection on freedom. Freedom considered theologically does not consist in this. And even if you were to argue successfully that theological freedom, as I described it a moment ago, has to presuppose the existence in human beings of the capacity to move in this direction or that direction on the basis of rational considerations, you would not have, have succeeded in finding a precondition in God for the eternal activity that God is. For to say that God could move himself in this direction or that direction or not at all, and that his freedom consists precisely in this, is to make God's freedom something he has in himself apart from and prior to that eternal event. It is to ascribe to God a different state of being than the one made known in Jesus Christ. My leading question in this lecture has to do with the meaning of divine freedom and its relation to necessity in God. I said in my last lecture that all the terms we use to describe God must receive their meaning from the being in act that God is. They must not be brought to him from without. That is not to say that the words employed will not be human words. They're the only kind we have at our disposal. It is only to say that the norm for their correct usage must be God himself and not some other object. I will begin then with a major section devoted to freedom and necessity, and that will lead me quite naturally to a consideration of divine aseity, which will be the subject of the second section of this lecture. I will conclude with some reflections on the implications of the decisions made in, the, in relation to these two questions for the, for the final question of how to go about the task of defining the various divine attributes. So to begin, on freedom and necessity in God, a conversation with Karl Barth. The question of the reality or being of God for Barth is the question of what God is. Not only who God is, but what he is. Here already a significant departure has occurred from what might, we might characterize generally as classical theism. Classically, it was frequently claimed that it is impossible to know what God is. We can only know that God is and who God is. But Bart very clearly thinks that it is possible to know what God is, precisely because what God is is something that is given to us to know in his self-revelation. And here I quote Bart. What God is as God, the divine individuality and characteristics, the essentia or essence of God, is something which we shall encounter either at the place where God deals with us as Lord and Savior or not at all. Therefore, our first and decisive transcription of the statement that God is must be that God is who he is in the act of revelation. We are, in fact, interpreting the being of God when we describe it as God's being in act, namely, in the act of his revelation in which the being of God declares his own reality. Not only the reality for us, certainly that, 
but at the same time, his own inner proper reality behind which and above which there is no other, unquote. Notice in this passage, what we encounter in Jesus Christ is the essence of God. Bart makes no distinction between who and what, since the what is contained in the who. Notice, too, that the act referred to in this context, in speaking of God's being in act, is the concrete act of revelation. Moreover, God's true being, his essence, can be a being in this particular act because this particular act is not simply for us, subjectively, but is rather, as he puts it, his own inner proper reality behind which and above which there is no other." Unquote. Seen in this light, it would be a mistake to distinguish in God, first, a being in the, in the act of self-constitution as triune, and then, second, a being in the act of revelation, if to do so meant that we were assigning a different, at best analogous, content to each. No, what God is in himself is what he is in his revelation and vice versa. That much really ought to be beyond dispute. And so Bart can say, to its very depth, God's Godhead consists in the fact that it is an event. God's Godhead is an, an event. Not any event, not events in general, but the event of his action, in which we have a share in God's revelation. It was quite right when the older theology, he's thinking of 17th century Reformed Orthodoxy in particular, it was quite right when the older theology described the essence of God as vita, and again as actuositas, or simply as actus. What was meant was actus purus, indeed purissimus, unquote. But then Bart immediately adds, quote, in speaking of the essence of God, we are concerned with an act which utterly surpasses the whole of the actuality that we have come to know as act in this world, and compared with which all that we have come to know as act is no act at all, because as act it can be transcended. This is not the case with the act of God that happens in Revelation." Unquote. What Bart is suggesting is that we speak responsibly of the reality of God as actus purus only where we recognize that the act in which God has his being is utterly unique. Yes, the act in which God has his being is also an act, an event in this world, but it is an event which cannot be compared to any other. And so Bart says, quote, actus purus is not sufficient as a description of God. To it, there must be added, at the very least, et singularis, unquote. To say of God that he is actus purus et singularis is to say that God has his being in the singularity of the event of his self-revelation. But what is it that makes this event unique? How is it that it transcends all that we know elsewhere as act? Bart explains his claim this way. The fact that God's being is event, the event of God's act, necessarily means that it is his own conscious, willed, and executed decision. It is his own decision, and therefore independent of the decisions by which we validate our existence. It is his conscious decision and therefore not the mechanical outcome of a process, the rationality of which will have to be sought outside of itself. It is his willed decision, and therefore not an event occurring through external causes or only in an eternal relationship. It is his executed decision, executed once and for all in eternity and anew in every second of our time, and therefore in such a way that it confronts what is not divine being, not merely as a possibility, but always as a self-contained, self-containing reality. 
No other being exists absolutely in its act. We began with the question of what makes this act different from all other acts, and this is the answer. No other being exists absolutely in its act. No other being is absolutely its own conscious, willed, and executed decision." Unquote. God is his own decision. A consciously willed decision, Bart says. A decision executed once and for all in eternity. In saying this, Bart looks away briefly from the being of act in act of God in his self-revelation to his eternal being in the act of election. He does not name it as such in this particular context, but we may be confident that that is indeed what he means. After all, what other conscious, willed, and executed decision might there be in eternity other than election? Neither scripture nor the tradition knows of any other such eternal decision which might be laid alongside of election. In any event, Bart's interest in this context lies in explaining how it is possible for God's being to be a being in the act of revelation. And his solution is to suggest that God's eternal being is a being for this event in time. God's being can be a being in this act in time because God is his own conscious, willed, and executed decision in eternity. This is what eliminates the metaphysical gap between God and himself and God for us. And this is what makes the event of God's being utterly unique or singular. Thus far, Bart's intentions should be quite clear. But as is well known by now, his execution of these intentions is anything but sure-footed at times. The reason is that he has other concerns divine self-sufficiency, for example, which are not obviously compatible with the concern that God be understood as fully God in his self-revelation. And so one can find passages in which Bart suggests that God would still be what he is in his self-revelation, even without a world, and therefore without a relationship with that which is other than himself. The problem with such statements is this. If God could be what he is without a world, then the relationship to the world would be something added to God. And if God is indeed immutable, then what is added to him could not possibly have any ontological significance whatsoever. It is in this way that Bart sometimes quite unintentionally, I think, reopens the metaphysical gap between God and himself and God for us that he is so concerned elsewhere to eliminate. Having said that much, however, I should add that sometimes, when Bart seems to be on the verge of reopening the metaphysical gap, he immediately turns around and tries to close it again. Let me give you an example, quoting Bart. God is he who, without having to do so, seeks and creates fellowship between himself and us. He does not have to do this, because in himself, without us, and therefore without this fellowship with us, he has that which he seeks and creates between himself and us. It implies, so to speak, an overflow of his essence that he turns to us." Unquote. But for that last sentence, sentence, an overflow of his essence, the claims made thus far could have been made by any classical theologian. Like them, Bart is clearly concerned to say that God is sufficient in himself as the object of his own love. But then Bart continues, we must certainly regard this overflow as itself matching his essence and indeed as belonging to his essence, unquote. That the overflow of the divine love should be essential to God would certainly render impossible a voluntaristic conception of the divine freedom. But there's more. For then, Bart recalls election. He says that God, quote, wills to be ours and he wills that we should be his. He does not will to be God for himself, nor as God to be alone with himself. 
He wills to be God for us and with us who are not God. He does not will to be himself in any other way than he is in this relationship. Unquote. Okay. So the overflow of the divine love is in some sense willed activity. But Barth has also said in this passage that this overflow is essential to God. But if it is essential to God, what kind of willing could this be? Is it a choice amongst options? No, that is not possible. Unless God's essential being could have turned out to be other than what it is. And clearly Bart does not think that. Hence, he must have a different understanding of divine freedom up and running. Again, I quote Bart. His life, God's life, that is, his life in himself, which is originally and properly the one and only life, <coughs> leans towards this unity with our life. Leans towards is Jeffrey Bromley's translation of the German drängt nach, a construction which might be better translated as presses towards. This is how God is love, according to Bart. God's life in himself presses towards unity with our own. Friedrich Schleiermacher actually said the very same thing. God's life in himself presses towards unity with our own. God's love has in itself an inclination, a propensity for fellowship with human beings. And so Bart concludes that God wills just one thing, namely fellowship with the human race. And, quote, this one thing is the essence of God in the revelation of his name. That is to say, we shall find in God himself, in his eternal being, nothing other than this one thing, unquote. Seen in, this, in, in, the, in the light of this textual evidence, the conclusion seems unavoidable. If we were to say that fellowship with human beings is freely chosen by God, we would be speaking improperly if what was meant by that is a choosing amongst options. Instead, we should think of it this way. God is free, not before choosing, and in order to be able to choose, but in the eternal act of choosing, in his eternal exercise of freedom for one thing and one thing only. Such a conclusion makes very good sense of what Bart goes on to say about divine freedom when in Church Dogmatics 2.1 he takes up the subject directly. He begins that section with a protest against the classical treatment of divine freedom which was focused, he says, upon God's independence in relation to the world. Independence, he says, is a strictly negative definition of divine freedom. It is God's freedom from the world, his freedom from external conditions. Bart wants to say that too, of course, and it is right that he should. Freedom in God certainly also means that God is in no way dependent upon the world in doing what he does. Bart's point, however, is this. Where freedom as independence, the negative definition, is made to be primary in our thinking. What is, in fact, primary will almost inevitably be disregarded. What's primary is God's positive freedom, his freedom for the world. Quoting Bart, according to biblical testimony, God has the prerogative to be free without being limited by his freedom from external conditioning. Free to be free without being limited by his freedom from external conditioning, free also with regard to his freedom, free not to surrender himself to it, but to use it to give himself to this communion with the human race and to practice faithfulness in it, and in this way, being really free, free in himself. God must not only be unconditioned, but in the absoluteness in which he sets up this fellowship, he can and will also be conditioned. This ability, proved and manifested to us in his action, constitutes his freedom." Unquote. What Bart is saying, it seems to me, is that God's freedom consists in his ability to give himself to a relationship with the human race 
and in that relationship to be conditioned. We might better say affected without giving himself, without giving his being as God away. An unconditional willing of conditioned existence then. An act of self-determination which provides the ontic ground for God's freedom for the world and for the human race. An act behind which it is impossible to penetrate because there is nothing behind it. That is Barth's positive definition of the phrase divine freedom. Is then divine self-determination, to use Barth's word, for this freedom itself a free decision or a necessary decision? The very form of the question, the either-or structure of it, betrays the presence of a metaphysical subject lurking in the background who somehow pre-exists the act of self-determination. And for that reason, either answer we might give to this question would be wrong. The question itself is, in my view, illegitimate, since the subject it presupposes is the abstract subject of metaphysics. Were we to try, nevertheless, to answer it, we would wind up either making the world to be absolutely necessary to God, or we would wind up making divine freedom voluntaristic. Either way, we would make, be making God part of this world, and the otherness of God would have been set aside. We would either make God the unconditioned ground of all things, which reduces God to the unity at the heart of things, leading to determinism, or we would make God a finite cause amongst other finite causes in relation to which he would be distinguishable only as the biggest and best, which is what inevitably happens when we make divine freedom to be voluntaristic in nature. Divine freedom, I want to say, is a description of an eternal event in which God determines to give himself over to the human experience of judgment and perdition without giving himself away. It is in that event that God has his eternal being and is what he is. And therefore, the event of the divine reality precedes and defines divine possibility. We cannot talk about what is possible for God without first defining the reality of God, without first being encountered by the reality of God. Possibility follows reality. In truth, even Barth's term decision can be somewhat misleading. What he seeks to say with it is that the being of God is complete in itself before God creates. God is triune already in protology, in pretemporal eternity. And that is something I am fully committed to as well. But because God's being is a being in the act of electing, the decision is really a deciding an ongoing act which distinguishes itself from an eternal now as a moment without before and after by virtue of the fact that it contains a telos in itself, namely the consummation of eschatological fellowship with human beings. When that consummation comes, all that God already is in protology and his being for us will be known universally by all human beings. What then about necessity in God? Are creation and redemption necessary for God? The answer depends on what is meant by necessity. Typically, necessity is defined as the polar opposite of voluntaristic freedom, as the negation of freedom so defined. Applied to God, necessity would then mean God had no choice but to do what he did. Absolute necessity would mean no choice. But that, in my view, would be wrong. What God can choose is revealed in the choosing itself. He is free in the choosing because he is himself in the choosing. He is free to be fully and completely himself. Freedom, on this view, does not require having more than one option. One will do one option will do quite nicely if it is the one thing, as the character Curly puts it in the Billy Crystal movie, City Slickers, the one thing in the choosing of which meaning and purpose and indeed being itself are all contained. 
Seen in this light, having multiple options is actually a counterfeit freedom. The freedom with the seductive power of the serpent who says to us, if you would but know the difference between right and wrong, you can then make a responsible choice between them for yourself. No, if it is really true that you do know the difference between right and wrong, then you are already so fully committed to the good that for you there is only one choice, and that choice has already been made in the knowing itself. In any event, freedom and necessity do not fall apart in God the way they do for finite subjects with limited knowledge of themselves and the world around them. God, I want to say, is necessarily free and freely necessary, and both simultaneously. So the use of each term must be conditioned by the proper use of the other. Yesterday I made mention of the fact that Bruce Marshall thinks he can require of me that I choose between freedom and necessity in the sense, in which, in the sense which he assigns to those terms. I rejected the first of, the, of these alternatives yesterday. Today I simply wish to say that I reject the second as well. God is not constrained to act by anything external to himself or even by internal need or want to make up for, let us say, a deficiency in his being. God has no deficiency of being. What God does is not necessary in this sense. But necessity is not an altogether inappropriate word to use to describe what God must be and do as a consequence of the fact that he has his being in the eternal act of election. My point is, the choices aren't limited to no choice, everything's absolutely necessary, or having options, voluntaristic freedom. God's freedom exists in his exercise of it in relation to one option, which is quite real. So the alternatives presented to me by, by Marshall are a false alternative. Turning then to divine aseity, and here I want to carry this out by means of a, a conversation with John Webster. That God is a say, that his being is characterized by aseity, means that he is from himself <clears throat> or of himself. What do we, we mean when we say this? <clears throat> what does such a conception entail? John Webster says there are two entailments, and I quote Webster. First, it indicates the glory and plenitude of the life of the Holy Trinity in its self-existent and self-moving originality, its underived fullness. In every respect, God is of himself God. Second, it indicates that God's originality and fullness constitute the ground of his self-communication. He is one who, out of nothing other than his own self-sufficiency, brings creatures into being." Unquote. So aseity, for Webster, <clears throat> has to do with the plenitude of God, God's fullness of being, which includes the notion of self-sufficiency. And that, in turn, implies a particular understanding of the act of creation and the God-world relation established in it. But where does Webster get this definition from? Where does he learn that God is rightly characterized in this way? His answer is clear, at least initially. Quote, God is not to be found in generalities. Deus non est in genera. And this means, quote, concepts developed in articulating the Christian doctrine of God, including the concept of aseity, are fitting insofar as they correspond to the particular being of the triune God in his self-moved self-presentation, unquote. In other words, we need to look to God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. And yet, <clears throat> Webster leaves room for a second and different approach. I quote Webster, in theological usage, aseity is not primarily a comparative or contrastive concept. That is, the content of the term cannot be determined simply by analysis of the difference between God and contingent creatures. 
although the contrast between divine self-existence and creaturely contingency is a corollary of the concept of God's aseity, disorder threatens when this contrast is allowed to expand and fill the concept of aseity completely." Unquote. The crucial phrase here would seem to be to expand and fill the concept completely. Webster seems to think that the use of a contrastive method on the part of the church fathers was somehow incomplete, that it was wed to a positive approach which looked to God's self-revelation in Christ, and indeed that the former contrastive method was controlled by the latter Christocentric method. The moderns, on the other hand, seem in Webster's view to have given themselves entirely over to the contrastive method. Now, I find this depiction of the history of reflection on the being of God to be dubious, both as it touches upon ancient theologians and as it touches upon modern theologians. But it is really only the former Webster himself is interested in. His first and chief witness here is Augustine, who wrote the following. See, heaven and earth exist. They cry aloud that they are made, for they suffer change and variation. But in anything which is not made and yet is, there is nothing which previously was not present." Unquote. I would submit that Augustine's use of negative theology here in this passage is anything but informal and non-fundamental as Webster claims it is. The contrast is established by starting with the mutability of creation as such. Without that starting point, Augustine could not arrive at a concept of the immutability of that which is not made, namely the creator. The mutability of the created would certainly seem to be the epistemic foundation of the move Augustine is making here. I'll leave the question of the adequacy of Webster's interpretation of Augustine to specialists in that field. I'm more interested myself in the moves he makes next. Webster insists, quite rightly in my view, that God's aseity is not the mirror image of contingency. And he is also right not only in making appeal to the doctrine of the Trinity to, quote, fill out the notion of aseity, unquote, but also, and more importantly, in his claim that the Trinitarian life of God, which should control the meaning of aseity, has both imminent and economic dimensions. Let me repeat that, because I'm not sure everybody who reads John on aseity really sees this passage and faces up to it in what it says. Webster says that the Trinitarian life of God, which should control the meaning of the divine aseity, has both imminent and economic dimensions. That this is so has to do with the fact that, quote, the perfection of God's life as autotheos, as God of himself, includes his works as Father, Son, and Spirit in creation, reconciliation, and redemption." Unquote. So for Webster too, then, the eternal processions contain the temporal missions, as I suggested yesterday in my lecture on the, Trin lecture on the Trinity. And thus far, he and I would seem to be in lockstep. A difference emerges, however, at the point at which Webster speaks of God's imminent life. And here he retreats to Exodus 3.14, a very classical move indeed, as basic to the understanding of God's aseity in its imminent dimension. Quoting Webster, first and foremost, aseity is a statement of the divine I am, unquote. The appeal to Augustine becomes more comprehensible in the light of this statement. For the positive dimension in Augustine's conception of aseity, according to Webster, is seen to arise, quote, doxologically from a stance in the presence of the divine self-naming as I am, unquote. Interestingly, no mention is made here of Christology, of the truly definitive self-naming of God, of the Jesus who can say, I am, of himself, of the Jesus who, according to the New Testament, is included in the identity of God. Now, Webster is entirely right to insist that aseity is first and foremost a positive concept. It is not to be reduced to a negative definition along the lines of underived being, as he puts it. 
But Webster's positive concept, rooted as it is simply in the I am of Exodus 3.14, does not rise to the heights of what might be desired. Webster puts the positive element this way, and I quote, Aseity is life, God's life from and therefore in himself. This life is the relations of Father, Son, and Spirit, unquote. In my view, this statement is true and completely unobjectionable, but true and unobjectionable only when seen in the right light. The problem for me is that the statement as it stands floats free of Christological reflection so that it becomes abstract and formal at the decisive point. What has made this result inevitable is Webster's commitment to the idea of divine simplicity, a commitment which puts in but a brief appearance in this essay but is made quite clear elsewhere in more recent essays. For those familiar with Karl Barth's treatment of divine freedom in Church Dogmatics 2.1, it will be readily apparent that Webster has been tracking closely with the moves Bart makes throughout his essay on aseity. But Webster's treatment of the problematic nature of certain traditional glosses on divine, even, excuse me, even his treatment of the problematic nature of certain traditional glosses on divine aseity, his treatment of God as causa sui and ens necessarium, follows Bart's own quite closely. What Webster leaves out of consideration, however, is the fact that when Barth speaks of a freedom for the world which is grounded in God's being for and in himself, Barth means a freedom for the human experiences of suffering and death endured by Jesus and the ontological receptivity on the part of the Logos which makes these human experiences to be an event in God's own life. Webster's understanding of divine aseity at the end of the day is Barth's but it is Barth's understanding completely stripped of his later Christology. And so at the point at which Webster comes to describe God's being in a lovely phrase as gift and grace, which he really must do since he maintains that aseity has both imminent and economic dimensions, he leaves the object of that gifting and that graciousness more or less unexplained. Quoting, Webster, the movement of God's triune life has its perfection in and of itself and is utterly sufficient to itself. But this perfect movement is not self-enclosed and self-revolving. In its perfection, it is also a movement of self-gift in which the complete love of Father, Son, and Spirit communicates itself ad extra, creating and sustaining a further object of love. Of himself, God is gracious, unquote. A most excellent statement, to be sure. The only problem is that the object of God's self-giving, its end as revealed in the suffering and death of Christ, is left completely out of account. And that's no mere oversight. It is the consequence of Webster's starting point in the I Am of Exodus 3.14, which is the text to which those committed to divine simplicity have always reverted. And so the object of God's gifting and graciousness, to use Webster's phrase, would seem to be creation. Not Christ, but creation. A creation which, considered an abstraction from Christ, begins to take on an independent significance, which is the basis of all natural theologies. If God is ontologically receptive to the man Jesus, however, if it is true, as Barth says, that what the man Jesus does is God's own work, and Jesus' lived obedience cannot be alien to God, then non-composition, simplicity, cannot be ascribed to God. That God is not dependent upon the world, that the grace of God is truly grace in the sense of being unmerited and undeserved, is certainly true. But it is also true that God gives himself over to suffering and death without giving himself away. God is fully God precisely in the human experience of suffering and dying. And that must also mean that God is not changed by composition. That such composition as is proper to God is a composition to which he gives himself sovereignly. How then are we to define aseity? I said a few moments ago that I quite like Webster's positive definition, 
Aseity means for him God's life from and therefore in himself. God does indeed have life from himself. And God's triune being is indeed complete in protology. What I miss in Webster's explanation of the meaning of this statement, however, is Bart's insight that God is free also with regard to his freedom. That God is free not only to be unconditioned, but in the absoluteness in which he sets up fellowship with human beings, he can and will also be conditioned. The aseity of God understood in terms of the eternal exercise of divine freedom is the description of an eternal act which looks both inward and outwards at the same time. That is to say, it is an eternal act in which God constitutes himself as triune, looking inward, and an eternal act in which he moves outward in a loving and redemptive self-giving. And so God's being is, as Webster rightly says, gift and grace. Let me just say before concluding these reflections on aseity that we do well not to describe the eternal self-constitution of God in terms of the category of causation. What we know of causation in our world is inescapably temporal. It always entails a before and after. Applying this language to God not only loses sight of the single eternal event in which God is and has his being, it also gives rise to the logical conundrum of how one and the same subject can be both cause and that which is caused. But God is not self-caused reality. He does not create himself out of nothing, which is an absurd idea on the face of it. Nor, as I argued yesterday, does the divine subject pre-exist this act. So from whatever angle we look at it, self-causation is a bad idea. <coughs> In classical theology, when, it's, when God's triunity, his self-constitution as triune, is treated as a necessary act, um, Classical theologians are always resistant to positing either anything behind it, a fourth something, whether that be substance or whether that be a hidden subject or anything of that nature. God is what he is eternally in that activity. And all I've done is built election into that. It's not that I've become nominalistic. It's not that I have made the world absolutely necessary. I have moved election into that understanding and therefore built upon the tradition. Okay. Third section, the divine attributes, once more, a conversation with Karl Barth. Aseity, as I have just defined it, is not an attribute of God. It is and it is not, I should say. Insofar as it seeks to speak of God as self-originating and as the self-originated being, it is not yet an attribute. That God is self-originated, and creatures receive their life from another is indeed constitutive of the creator-creature creator distinction. But to say only that much is to remain at a very formal level of analysis. As the Cappadocian fathers rightly recognized, a mode of origination is not a predicate. It is only a way of speaking of the thatness of a thing. Aseity only becomes a divine attribute insofar as it is a description of God's being in the eternal act of election. Insofar as it contains in itself a materially rich conception of the teleologically ordered being of God. But then we are simply speaking then of God's life, God's livingness as the triune God who is for us. From the earliest days of Christian theologizing on the basis of Holy Scripture, the attributes of God were understood to be descriptions of the God who has revealed himself. As Bart once put it, and I quote, God's attributes are the conditions on the basis of which God's essence gives itself to be known by us through his word, unquote. But even as he wrote this impressive statement, Bart's own approach to the doctrine of God remained much too formal. The Bart of the Göttingen dogmatics, in which this statement appears, sought to derive the attributes and to order them into two classes on the basis of the formal structure of his concept of revelation. 
that God's essence gives itself to be known by us through his word, meant for him at that time, through the dialectic of veiling and unveiling in the address of God to us in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. In that God unveils himself in and through certain creaturely media, above all the humanity of Christ, he remains the hidden subject of that unveiling. Hiddenness precisely in revelation, non-givenness in objective givenness. That was the starting point for all of Barth's reflections on the being and, and attributes of God at this stage of his development. And so it is not surprising that Barth understood his own contribution to the doctrine of God at this point in time as a mere, quote, reformulation of the old reform school of doctrine and not as an innovation. It is also not surprising that he could give cautious approval to the classical via eminentiae and the via negativa, to the cataphatic and the apophatic of pseudo Dionysius. As long as, he says, the order of treatment is first the positive and only then the negative, first revelation and then hiddenness. Because hiddenness, if it is truly to be the hiddenness of God, is a hiddenness in revelation. Bart believed he could take up and make use of the classical ways, even the via causalitatis, so long as the reality of the knowledge of God was understood to precede the possibility of human description of God. So long as the three ways were brought in simply to flesh out what had been made known in God's word. The problem, of course, as the history of, of theology shows, is that the definitions given to the words and concepts used to describe God, which lay at the end of the classical three ways, did not presuppose a knowledge of God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. The three ways were an exercise in metaphysical thinking. And the content of the words and concepts which lay at the end of these ways was, were ineradicably metaphysical. That Barth thought he could corral these words and concepts and make them serviceable to a theology of revelation only showed how formal his concept of revelation still was at this point in time. That he thought he could render them useful in witnessing to the divine reality by means of the simple expedient of playing the attributes of aseity off against the attributes of personality as a corrective, as a great warning, and yet promising, however, shows how far Bart is from the Christocentrism of his mature theology, from the stringent effort to base everything said about God upon the narrated history of Jesus as attested in Holy Scripture. Bart would not re reach that point until he had revised his doctrine of election. It is only in the doctrine of creation in 3.1 that his Christocentrism, the Christocentrism for which he is justly famous, first begins to appear. And that means, too, that even the formula employed as basic to Bart's later derivation of the divine attributes and their classification in Church Dogmatics 2.1, the being who loves in freedom, is, in my judgment, still too formal, too abstract. For at that, even at that late date, his thinking was still controlled by the formal structure of his concept of revelation, which had the consequence still that he was trying to give content to biblical words and concepts by means of the dialectical stratagem of pairing concepts he thought to belong to the divine love with concepts he had assigned to the divine freedom and vice versa rather than simply allowing each word or concept to be given its content through sustained attention to the eternal act whose content is made known in and through the history of Jesus. I think myself the time has come to do away with all divisions of divine attributes into two classes. All of the schemes proposed to this point in time, negative and positive, incommunicable and communicable, the Tomasian distinction between the imminent and the relative, and even Barth's distinction between love and freedom, which maps directly onto his earlier distinction between personality and aseity. All of these schemes have their root historically in the metaphysics of the apophatic and the cataphatic. The apophatic move consists in a negation of certain attributes of creatures considered generally, the cataphatic in the elevation of certain faculties and virtues found in human beings alone. In both cases, the ground of reflection upon God is something other than Jesus Christ. It is either cosmology or anthropology or some combination of the two.
Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that everything which classical theologians had to say about God was simply wrong. The truly great among them wrestled intensively with Scripture. And those words and concepts used to speak of God, which had solid biblical warrant, usually had a great deal of biblical content in them. For that reason, we can learn much from a Thomas Aquinas especially, whose biblical commentaries are just starting to be mined in an effort to give balance to his speculative metaphysics. But there can be no question but that the three ways added to biblical concepts and words, other concepts and words, which are lacking in biblical support, and which, given the priority which the apophatic often had over the cataphatic, were made fundamental to the definitions of all that followed, including goodness, knowledge, and wisdom. I am thinking, of course, of the concepts of simplicity, impassibility, and even unity when unity is abstracted from its proper home in the doctrine of the Trinity. But I'm also thinking of the modern concepts of the absolute, the unconditioned, the ground of being. We can sum up the significance of the elimination of classification schemes in three steps. First, if God is essentially what he is in the eternal act in which he sets himself in relation, inwardly and outwardly, then there are no purely negative attributes. Expressed another way, all of God's attributes are relative in the sense of relationally defined. None are only imminent. Second, if God is essentially what he is in the eternal act which grounds his self-communication, then all of the attributes of God are communicable. All of them find an analog in human life. But of course, all of them are incommunicable at the same time in the sense that human participation in them is not a substantial participation or even a participation in the energies proper to a substance. Participation comes about through lived correspondence in faith and obedience. But that then also means that none of God's attributes are communicable as they are in him. Hence the distinction between attributes which are incommunicable and other attributes which are communicable falls to the ground. Every divine attribute that is truly a divine attribute is both. Third and finally, if God is essentially what he is in the eternal act in which freedom and necessity come together, then love and freedom employed as master concepts in an effort to make particular terms serviceable for speaking of God cannot finally be adequate, though it comes closer than previous schemes. What happens in Barth's doctrine of God in 2.1 is that certain concepts are used to try to strip from other concepts the metaphysical baggage which comes with them. A better course of action, it seems to me, would be to avoid using all terms whose only source is metaphysics and never to use a biblical term in anything other than a biblical way. What happens when we do that? Well, let me make the omnis my primary example, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. The prefix omni constitutes an infinite expansion in all directions of anything to which it is attached. In that God is said to be omnipotent, he is said to possess power to do all things possible to him and not merely all that he in fact does. This expansion, it seems to me, may well be logical, but the use of logic in the sphere of that which is truly and utterly unique invites problems. Problems created by a comparison of God with creatures. We humans are able to move ourselves in this direction or that. Logically, if God is infinitely more than we are, he must be able to do this too, but his options must be infinite in number, or so the logic of comparison would suggest. We already saw the flaw in this when treating divine freedom. No, the Bible gives us license to say no more than that God is able. God has all the power he needs to do that which he wills, to see to it that his ends are accomplished. To ascribe to him anything more than that is sheer speculation. 
I might add that the nominalist distinction between absolute power and ordained power has no place here. All of God's power is ordained. I think myself that Thomas Aquinas actually believed something quite close to this, since A, Thomas believed that there is in God no unrealized potentiality, B, that God's goodness is self diffusive and C, that God's knowledge is common. What then of God's knowledge is omniscience, the right word to describe it? Here, too, the use of the omni prefix, prefix constitutes an illegitimate and impermissible expansion. God knows all things that have been, are, and will be. God knows the real. That much is clearly biblical. To say that God knows of other unrealized possibilities is to pass beyond what the Bible allows us to say. Moreover, to divide God's knowledge into a natural knowledge, which he has of himself, and his free knowledge of those things he will freely create is a mistake that rests on a false conception of divine freedom and the equally impossible conception of absolute necessity which follows upon it. In the late 16th century, the Spanish Jesuit Luis de Molina said that the former kind of knowledge, natural knowledge, is pre-volitional and so necessary in the sense that no involvement of the will was envisioned, and that the latter kind of knowledge, free knowledge, is post-volitional, in that it is something that God added to his natural knowledge in choosing freely to create this particular world rather than another. But in addition, Molina wanted to say that God also knows counterfactuals. God knows, for example, what would have happened um, had uh, President Kennedy not been assassinated. God knows whether we would have still been committed to Vietnam, etc. God knows counterfactual. God possesses an exhaustive foreknowledge not only of what will be, but additionally of what might have been had he chosen to arrange things differently. And because the things not willed by God are not metaphysically necessary, as he himself is, knowledge of them is like his knowledge of those things he freely decrees will happen. On the other hand, God's knowledge of counterfactuals is also pre-volitional. By that, Molina means that God knows all things possible since he knows all the causative powers that might be operative in any possible world precisely in knowing himself, since he is the cause of all causal powers. And so because God's knowledge of counterfactuals is both like natural knowledge in being pre-volitional, and like free knowledge in having as its object things that are not met metaphysically necessary, because it shares characteristics with both of the first two classes, it is rightly understood as a third class of divine knowledge, which Molina called middle knowledge. Molina's views found support of, uh, amongst his fellow Jesuits and the Lutherans, and later amongst the Arminians. He was opposed by the Dominicans and the Reformed. The latter did not deny the existence in God of a knowledge of counterfactuals, but they did consign that knowledge entirely to free knowledge so that they held their to only two classes of divine knowledge rather than three. Okay. It seems to me that the mistake in all of this, on every side of the debate, lies in the failure of all the combatants to recognize that in God, knowing and willing must be identical. God knows what he wills and he wills what he knows. There is no such thing as a pre-volitional knowledge. God's knowledge of himself is the knowledge not of, the, of a metaphysically necessary being, but of a freely necessary and necessarily free being in the act of election. There is also no such thing as a post-volitional knowledge, a knowledge which God can only acquire after he has decided upon a particular course of action to the exclusion of other possible courses of action. God knows all things in knowing himself. And the all things that he knows consists in the real, not in possibilities that are utterly devoid of reality. In relation to omnipresence, we are actually on more solid ground because the prefix is, in this case, limited to the world that actually is. The meaning of the doctrine classically was that God is fully present at every point in the universe he has made. That is to say, his being is not diffused throughout the universe. 
Rather, he is present at every point in the totality of what he is, in the fullness of his being, at every point in the universe. That is, I think, sound doctrine, and I wouldn't wish to challenge it. I would only add that the God who is present at every point in the universe is the God who has his being in redemptive activity, and that omnipresence is not for the purpose of making a causal contribution to every event. God is not, as I said in my first lecture, omnicausal. In scholastic Protestantism, God's omnipresence was distinguished from his immensity on the grounds that the former had to do only with God's freely adopted presence to all things in this world, in this universe, the world of time, whereas the latter, immensity, was an eternal and absolute attribute of God consisting in a capacity to be present to all things in any possible world. Against this conception, I have already pointed out the problems attending a distinction between imminent and relative attributes. What I would like to add is that I find no warrant in scripture for believing that God has capacities which somehow await activation. God is eternally active. Does this then mean that creation is eternal? No, God alone is eternal. Even if we were to say that his creative activity, that is to say his bringing of all things into being out of nothing, is an activity which in him has no beginning, we would still have to say that creation has a beginning. Now this might sound incoherent or even contradictory, but it isn't. To speak of a beginning, as Genesis 1 and John 1 do, is to speak of God's creative activity from the standpoint of its result. It is to speak of an event which belongs to the sequence of events which takes place in our temporally structured world. Time itself, as Augustine insisted, is created. But the very same event might also be described from the standpoint of the God who engages in it. God is eternal, and the creative activity in which he engages is an activity which is contained in the eternal activity that God is. To put it this way is also to suggest that eternity is not timelessness. Eternity, like all the divine attributes, is a description of God in the eternal act of election. And because election is a choosing to become human in time, eternity is a description of that act of God which contains, surrounds, and encloses time. God is not temporal as you and I are, but on the other hand, temporality as you and I know and experience it is not, at the end of the day, alien to the innermost reality of God. Otherwise, the incarnation would be an impossibility. God is outside time as the act which founds time. So, is God's creative activity eternal? Well, think about it this way. Ask yourself, is there a time lag between the eternal act of election and the act of creating? Well, if Augustine is right and time itself is created, how could there be a time lag in pretemporal? This is not to say that there is never a time lag between election and something God does. God does not send his son into this world at the beginning of time, but in the midst of the flow of historical events. It is only to say that a time lag in pre-temporal eternity doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What then of immutability? God is immutably what he is in the eternal act of election. The key to understanding div divine immutability is found, it seems to me, in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It is as this son and in the power of the Holy Spirit that the Father, too, is unchangeably who and what he is. God's justice and goodness, his love, holiness, and wisdom all need to be thought about as descriptions of the being of God in the act of election. But I'm going to postpone that task for the published version of these lectures and bring this discussion to a close. For now, I will simply say that wrath and mercy do not differ from these other attributes in that they alone require an object while God is these other things without a world. No, God is all of these things in relation to this world. But wrath is best understood as the instrument of God's mercy 
And both are expressions of God as holy love and therefore as just and good and wise. Conclusion. What I've tried to present to you in these lectures is a post-metaphysical evangelical doctrine of God that adheres as closely as possible to the Reformation principle, sola scriptura. I have tried to fight the temptation to be simply anti-metaphysical, and I've done this for two reasons. First, because Christian theology cannot live from deconstruction alone. It must proceed from deconstruction to the task of a positive doctrinal construction, or it will have nothing to offer to preachers and congregations. Second, because we can still learn a great deal from those theologians who gave themselves permission to engage in metaphysical reflection, whether the ancient metaphysicians or the modern ones. As I said earlier, earlier, the greatest among them also wrestled with Holy Scripture. And there are many insights to be found here and there which must be taken on board in a, in a post-metaphysical theology too. Besides, the relative authority proper to the church requires that we take with great seriousness the theological values which sought expression in the official teachings of the ecumenical church and of our individual churches. I would like here at the end of my work among you again to thank my hosts for their warm hospitality and the richness of their Christian fellowship and the good wishes they have expressed where my own work is concerned. And I would like especially to thank you, the audience, for your attentiveness throughout this week. I know I put serious demands on your capacities for hearing and comprehending, for thinking with and after me about things which really matter to all of us. And I'm grateful to you for your efforts and for your graciousness to me. Thank you. thoughtful and thought-provoking lecture. <coughs> this is the seventh of seven. Uh, we'll express gratitude again to you in a few minutes for a fabulous week, but uh, let me thank you now again for a, for a great talk. This is your last chance to ask questions of Dr. McCormick, and we really only have 10 or 15 minutes, so don't be shy in coming on up to the mics and, uh, and asking a question. Maybe what we ought to do today, uh, just to make sure we're doing this right, is tell us who you are and then pose a question. Okay. JK, That's you JK. <laughs> uh, program. Kevin Van Hooser is my advisor. And um, yes, I have uh, uh, two questions if you'll allow me. I'll be, I'll be uh, brief. Um, I had to write this down because at the beginning, uh, you were describing, I think in Bart's view or Bart's statements, uh, what God is. And you said something to the effect, um, no other being exists absolutely as act. Yeah, Ab absolutely in his act. Yeah. In his act. Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing I was wondering is, did Bart, in, in this uh, exposition, did Bart himself um, uh, explicitly um, disaffirm sim uh, divine simplicity? He, he criticizes it pretty strongly in 2.1, but without simply setting it aside. And what I would argue is that his later development would require of us that we do set it, set it aside. Kind of an implied uh, thing? He, it's, it's not, he doesn't yet see it that way okay. in 2-1. Um, okay. And part of the reason for that is the, the, real, the real shortcoming of classical Christology, as I described it yesterday, this vacillation between defining the Christological subject in one way when you're dealing with soteriology and defining it in a different way when you're talking about the communication of attributes is that the latter especially leaves the relation of human activities to the person of the union completely undefined. Mm -hmm. So, so, and so if, you, if you take the step, and Bart does this in his later Christology, of specifying that these human activities and human activities of this subject, that what happens to this human individual happens in the life of God, then you can't any longer hang on to simplicity. Well, on, on uh, th those terms, uh, that God is who he absolutely is in, 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 his, uh, in his act of being, yeah. Yeah. Um, on those terms, wouldn't that be uh, considered a, a, a proper redefining of divine simplicity? I don't think that the word would retain any of its uh, classical significance on those 
on that on that on that basis, and I don't know what it would then mean. Okay. Simplicity. I mean, I, I tried to show you in my uh, first historical lecture, lecture two, that that term in its origins, as it's as it's used in the second century, um, is so stripped by somebody like Clement of Alexandria of of any positive content that he winds up saying God is nameless. You know, and he uses a geometric analogy, if you'll remember, mm -hmm. uh, that enables him to, to strip even a mathematical point of its position in space so that there's nothing left. Yep. That's why I use the, the, uh, the word so, re I mean, redefining, but yeah, so, that's okay. so much depends on what the entailments are said to be. And by the way, when you're talking to defenders of simplicity, yep. they will always say to you, it simply means God is without bodily parts whenever they're on the defensive. But when they're trying to use the term positively in the development of their own theology, it means far more than that. There are always these other entailments that they don't mention when they're just defending it against critique. Okay, the, 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 the last question I have is, um, and just respond to, to this uh, okay. thought. Um, is, what would you say to your, the view you expressed as um, a restatement of Leib Leibniz's view uh, not as the best of all possible worlds, but instead, uh, on your model, the best necessary world. I'm not sure I can attach a meaning to that um, completely. I mean, we'd have to talk about it at some length. Uh, best necessary? I mean, this, this is the one option in which God exercises his freedom. So freedom and necessity come together in the divine relation to this world. Is it then the best? Well, that's a comparative statement. You know, it, it requires other possibilities to be compared to. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not Leibnizian. I'm, I'm trying to do the impossible. I'm trying to almost square the circle here. I'm trying to turn Baruch de Spinoza into an evangelical Christian. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. We, I good, shouldn't good, have probably said good, that. Good luck with that, by the way. No. Thank you. <laughs> uh, David Pfizer. I'm uh, also one of Van Hooser's orphans. And, uh, and, uh, my question for you is, uh, getting back to your uh, dissection of middle knowledge, are you familiar with uh, Terence Thiessen's Calvinist middle knowledge? No, I haven't seen it. Okay. Terence Thiessen. Yeah. I'm not even familiar with who that might be. Okay. Um, probably butchering his, his model, but in a very minimalist nutshell, he essentially locates God's decision for what world he creates in his eternal decree, yeah. and therefore uh, decides which world would be the best world based on his knowledge of all worlds. And I'm curious as to whether you think the location in eternity of that decision uh, makes that a better model, or whether you would still reject all forms of middle knowledge based on the model that you presented tonight? I, I reject the entire scheme that includes necessary knowledge, free knowledge, and middle knowledge. Because I don't think necessary knowledge is knowledge of a metaphysically necessary being. Jung once said, God is not necessary, God is more than necessary, and you have to play with that for a very long time before you figure out what he's talking about. But it's, it doesn't have to do with metaphysical necessity, which, which actually ends up with something dead and lifeless. God is more than necessary. God is free in his necessity and necessary in his freedom. So it's, it's bigger than that. Uh, free knowledge. God acquires knowledge after he chooses to do something. I mean, God knows all things in knowing himself. He knows himself perfectly. So that's not on either. And then middle knowledge, because it's simply a hybrid developed out of those two, no. Yes, Melvin. Thank you. Uh, Melvin Tinker, visitor from England. Uh, first of all, just to say that Thiessen has withdrawn his uh, thesis <laughs> in debate with Paul Helm. It's in Westminster oh. Theological Journal. 2009, number 71. So he's ditched it, said it can't work. Okay, so he's done that. Uh, uh, just a clarificatory uh, question uh, regarding um, 
the, the notion of uh, voluntaristic freedom in relation to God, which you question. Which kind of freedom? Uh, voluntaristic oh, okay. uh, freedom. Yeah. Um, as I said, it's clarificatory, really. My understanding was that voluntaristic freedom is irreducible and simply means I choose what I choose. In contrast to libertarian freedom, uh, which is the absolute power to contrary, which means that one must have various options. So therefore, it seems to me that even according to your model, um, the notion of voluntaristic freedom would apply to God. And one could read this off not, not, not having a, an a priori notion of voluntaristic freedom, but basically what we see God doing as revealed yeah. in Christ. Can you, can you uh, run by me again the, the distinction that you are referring to between voluntaristic and libertarian freedom? Yeah, voluntaristic freedom is irreducible. You cannot explain it in relation to anything else. And it's simply, I choose what I choose, which Edwards argued, I think. Yeah. Um, in contrast to libertarian freedom, which means absolute power to contrary, so I must have various options, so I can choose this or this, otherwise I do not have freedom. Yeah. I have two reactions to that. One is, I think those are permutations on the same theme, and I think historically they both have their origins and come together in the nominalist understanding of uh, potentia absoluta. That's what sets it free. And I think, I think that's a mistake. That's a historical mistake. I mean, if given the choice between Scotus and Thomas, I'll take the Thomas every day. Precisely along the, the lines of the three things I mentioned about Thomas in the midst of my lecture. Um, there is in God for Thomas no unrealized potentiality. Well, that's already a very striking thing. That's, that's a long way towards what I'm trying to do. And if I have Thomas at least a little on my side, I feel pretty good about that. Um, Hans Medwaimi, uh, Managing Director at the Center. Um, Bruce, thanks for the lecture series, and I've attended every one, and I was just trying to, trying to think about the um, significance of the entire uh, seven lectures for partisan theology, and I was wondering what you would, um, how you'd respond to this question, um, because I'm thinking there might be a, a strong and a weak kind of interpretation of the series. And the, the weak interpretation is something like what, what we have in scripture is metaphysically, or if you don't like that word, ontologically underdetermined. And you've offered a, a picture that is one of many, and you've given a number of reasons, prudential ones perhaps, for why modern theologians need to go with the model you've presented. And a stronger picture might be something like, it's not, the biblical data are not metaphysically underdetermined, that you really think that this, the, the, these, the constructive, uh, your last two or three lectures, that this is really what scripture is pointing to, and you're exhorting theologians, Protestant theologians especially, to go to follow you. Uh, how would you like us to, yeah. to interpret what you've given us? That is uh, so well articulated. I really appreciate your uh, assessment. I think that scripture is ontologically underdetermined, and underdetermined is the right phrase. I think that what I've offered you here is commensurate with the biblical witness. That's what, I'm, that's what I want to be normed by. Is it the only possible way to do it? I can only say that it's the best I can think of in relation to the history of doctrine as I know it. Um, nobody has the final word. And even if after a lot of interdisciplinary testing and after the fewer art dies down and people actually can engage in measured and calm reflection on my proposal, um, they, decide, they might decide it's pretty, pretty good and it solves a lot of problems and it gets us close to scripture and it overcomes the divide between the ancient world and the modern world so that we stop demonizing each other in the churches and we actually can have something to say to a world that is increasingly threatening to, to the existence of Christians. Um, they could decide all of that. But it still wouldn't mean that that's the final word because no human being can do that. Um, every one of us as interpreters of scripture has to be justified in our intellectual activity by God. 
just as we need as sinners to be justified, we need to be justified in our theologizing. He alone can decide. So I think I would go with the weaker version. Well, it seems to me that that's a fine note on which to conclude. So uh, let me thank Dr. McCormick for coming. We are very grateful to you for being with us, speaking into all kinds of things that are going on in our community, mm -hmm. helping us to understand your theology better, helping us to understand the doctrine of God and the Holy Trinity better. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hope this isn't the last time we get to see you and be with you. I hope, I hope that's the case too. Yeah. Would you all join me in thanking Dr. McCormick?